If you are thinking of doing the Tour de Mont Blanc or you have already booked a ticket and now you're trying to plan, get your gear right, I'm going to share a few tips to help you um, along the way if you are considering doing it the backpacking route. Uh, my wife and I, we just did it, uh, got back about a week ago and we backpacked through it primarily because one, we love backpacking, but also we booked our tickets about four or five weeks in advance of leaving. And so we just didn't have time to book any refuges and yeah, we just didn't have a lot of time to plan. So I'll just dive right into the gear. It's a little bit of a mess now, but I have everything pretty much collected as it was when we got back, including the things that I'm wearing right now. When we left, I was wearing this just pretty much some light running shorts and a nice breathable shirt. And then I've got some Merino ankle socks and um, my Garmin watch. And this is what I use to track everything. So as far as the footwear goes, so on this one, you'll see a lot of different opinions. Some people say you need hiking boots, some people go running shoes, all sorts of different options. I'm really comfortable on the trail at this point, And unless I have a really heavy pack or it's like a, not a trail, then I'm okay using trail runners. So that's what I use. These are just ultra lone peak, some number. And yeah, this is what I used. I do put insoles in them. I use super feet insoles and this worked out well. I don't tend to be super uh, susceptible to rolling my ankle though. So if that is something that you're dealing with, then do not run trail shoes. Cause there is rocks, roots, you know, it's very undulating throughout the trail, but it's all a trail. So it's not too bad. And then also I brought some uh, trail gaiters for those shoes. Didn't end up wearing them a single time because it was just hot and I didn't want uh, any more lack of breathability down there. So those were the shoes. Then first my backpack, this is the REI Flash 55 pack. Sadie and I, we both use the same pack. There's a women's version that has a little bit smaller frame, but uh, similar volume. And this is a great pack. They're very, very light. Um, we've done a few trips now um, with these, including backpacking in Alaska. And so long as you don't have an extremely heavy load, like over, I don't know, 50 pounds, then these are great. And it worked really well. So this was the pack. And then on the front, they come with a nice little phone pocket bag thing that's waterproof. So that was nice to just carry my phone. And then because I do video photo stuff, I had cameras and I had this uh, Peak Designs capture clip, which is just a way to carry my camera right on my shoulder strap where it's easily accessible. And it locks it on and off there if you need to do that. So Sadie and I each had one of those. That way we could share our camera. All right, then in addition to that, we also brought this one small bag and this is just a, uh, little bag that we rolled up, carried in our pack. And we used it for on the airplanes for like snacks and stuff. Um, we carried on everything just because we've heard of so many people having issues with their bags getting lost in transit. We just want to bring anything, everything on the plane so it couldn't get lost without us. And so we would, you know, stow overhead the backpack and then just use this for snacks and um, whatever we, we needed to keep with us. And then also because Sadie and I both um, work on our computers quite a bit and we kind of needed to be accessible, we actually brought a laptop and so we carried this big old thing with us. And I'll share more about what we did with that when we actually went on the hike later. So we had that backpack but it didn't actually go with us on the hike. Then we had this little zip bag. These things are awesome just for carrying snacks, stuff like that, just to keep it contained in your pack. That way you can just pull it out, eat, leave your garbage in there. And then at, at night, you know, you can sort through things, throw away garbage, whatever you need to. As far as our sleep system, so, I had done a bit of research prior trying to figure out what people recommended and the recommendations were all over the board because some people, yeah, I guess people just have different preferences and tolerances. And so knowing that it was the mountains, I ended up kind of just opting for my normal kit, which is this three kind of a four season tent actually from Nemo. I love this thing. It's the Kunai. It's a two person tent and it's standalone. So it has poles and the tent itself. Great tent. I've used that thing a ton in the winter and in the snow and in the summer and it works well and I can trust that it'll keep any moisture out if it comes. And then um, sleeping pad, we each had Nemo Tensor insulated sleeping pads. Again, I, I've grown to love this brand and so that's what I've been rocking. They have sweet little bags to help inflate the uh, pads too. So you don't have to sit there blowing on them for 10 minutes going hypoxic. So those were our pads. They're very lightweight. They're warm. These are, I think three or three and a half inches thick too, which is very adequate most of the time. And then we've got our sleeping bag. So these were in stuff sacks, obviously compressed down. And this is mine. It's a Nemo Rift 15. It's a down sleeping bag rated for 15 degrees. Um, 
and their ratings are actually true, so I know ratings can be all over the board, but this one's rated for 15. I've used it down to 15 before, and even colder with extra clothes, and it is very warm. I love this sleeping bag. And then Sadie has the exact same one, but in the female's version, which actually has a little bit more insulation because females tend to get colder easier. And so, we both have the same bag. This was the thing that I was seeking um, recommendations on prior to going, because I have some warmer weather bags, colder weather bags, and people recommended something in this ballpark, 15 Fahrenheit. We found these to be entirely the wrong, no, not entirely, but I didn't, I didn't think I made a good choice. And I'll tell you why later, but that's what we brought, 15 degree bag, and we were plenty warm. So moving on then, um, got these little sit pads. These are just nice for sitting down during the day, keeping your butt from getting wet when you're sitting on wet grass, stuff like that, or if you're on rocks and they're sharp. It's just nice, and then at night you can use it to kneel on to get in and out of your tent or, or put your feet on, whatever. So these are nice, they're super light, compact, and we just store those on the outside of our backpacks. And then we both had little inflatable pillows. Now I'm gonna dive into the clothes. So for this, we were going over to Europe for a total of two weeks, but we didn't really know how long the trail was gonna take us. We were thinking in the eight to 10 day ballpark, but like I said, we didn't have anything planned out specifically. And I just seen so much variation in recommendations, but we knew we would have at least a few extra days. And so we kind of took that into account, but overall we went fairly minimalist on the clothes. So I wore my shoes and then I had these flip flops that are just super light and I'd use those as camp shoes or if there's any showers, community showers, whatever, I'd use these. And then as far as the clothes go, this is everything I brought right here. So what I'm wearing and then this was all of my clothes for the entire trip. And they're in this little storage cube, which I really like in order to keep things separated and, and be able to pull it out, settle on the ground and sort through it as you as you need. So pretty much what I did, I brought a few pair of underwear, just one that I was wearing, two extras, all merino ex officio, and I liked them. I actually think I could have gotten away with just two. And then also merino socks, got two like mid, mid height, just lightweight merino darn tough socks. And then these ankle ones, and I ended up wearing these for pretty much the entire time. And then for shirts, like I said, I've got this t-shirt and then I have this one and this is a merino blend and I wore this one every day on the trail and then I would wear this one for transit or at night, anytime where I was moderately clean. And then this is a sun hoodie and it's just a, yeah, kind of a lightweight sweatshirt. So I'd wear it in the mornings or in the evenings or you could wear it if the, the sun is baking down too hot and you wanna escape. Uh, for jackets, I brought a puffy jacket. This is a Patagonia Nano Puff. And then I have a shell jacket and this is just a rain wind shell in case the weather got sour. And then I've got um, a pair of joggers. These are just lightweight sweatpants and um, these were my only other pants. I didn't have any extra shorts. I just brought these. And so I would wear these at night sometimes or again, like this shirt when I was kind of clean but didn't find myself using those much. And then I had a pair of gloves. These are just fairly thin, but uh, waterproof gloves. And that was mostly everything, except for a couple pieces that are in my camera kit. And I'll show you those in a second. And then Sadie and I shared a pack towel. This is a, I don't know what it is, pack, yeah, a pack towel. And we would just share this between the two of us. And if I ever don't have a towel like that, I'll just use my extra shirt or wear it, whatever I'm not wearing to dry off since it's clean water at that point. Now for my camera kit, skip past this if you don't care about camera stuff, but if you do, then I'll real briefly show you what I brought to film this. I'm going to be putting together a video of the whole trip and I was taking pictures along the way. And so I wanted to go light, but I also wanted to capture it, which is always just a bunch of decision-making to, to decide how minimal you wanna go. And so I just brought a flexible Joby tripod and this thing I could tie up or wrap around my trekking poles um, and make like a makeshift tripod or you can wrap around fence posts, pretty much anything. Very flexible and yeah, you can use it pretty much anywhere. Then I have this clamp for my GoPro and again, another flexible arm. So this can just clamp onto my trekking pole or branches, anything like that. So those were the only two camera holders that I brought. For the camera itself, I brought um, this as my main camera. This is a Sony a7C. It's a full frame camera, but it's a compact. So the eyepiece is down on the corner, but it's a phenomenal camera and the screen folds out. And so you can rotate it around and, and fold it back in to protect it. And then a Rode mic on top and a zoom lens, a wide angle, I think 17 to 28 camera on, and then an ND filter, variable ND. And so, 
used all of that. And then on the bottom was a Peak Designs base plate. And that fits into that shoulder strap as well as into the tripod. And then there's these little dongles that uh, connect into the sling that I'll show you in a second. So then for camera spare parts, I brought too much. I wanted to bring, well, I always wanna bring more than I need to, but I brought the mic that I'm actually using right now, the Rode wireless mic in case I got to this video while I was over there, which I didn't. And then a few spare memory cards, wrench, lens cover, little things like that. And then a wrist sling and a neck sling. And those were primarily for when we were not on the trail, whether we were at camp at night or walking around town afterwards some spare batteries i actually brought three spares for my sony and two spares for my gopro didn't end up using all of them and then the gopro i just had a hero 10 and then this bad boy here is a camera cover it's a again peak designs same brand as that mount system and it's just kind of like a rain jacket for my camera which i didn't end up having to use on this trip but it is very convenient if there is bad weather and then i brought a second lens 85 mil prime lens and that was nice to have i didn't end up using it a ton just because swapping lenses while you're cruising along is a little bit of a hassle so had that nice dead weight and then a lens cloth so that was the majority of the camera kit the last piece of it was my drone i brought a little drone i actually kind of last second switched things up and went with this so i had this dry bag and then inside I had Sadie and I's stocking cap and gaiters used to help protect it and then I have this DJI Mini 2 I think this one is and yeah brought that with me worked well um, there's a little bit of restriction limitation for where you can fly on the trail and so I didn't I wasn't super concerned about it but I did end up getting some good use out of it and this is just the remote and the spare batteries which turns out this spare battery bank is actually really convenient because if you don't need the drone batteries you can use it as a battery bank for other things which i'll dive into what else i brought for that later so that is the camera kit the sleep kit so for the other stuff first off i've got this little bag and this is my grab bag i made a video on it already which it's kind of just the kit that i take everywhere all the time no matter what and it has my garmin minry mini in reach this is a little satellite texting phone so i can reach people if you don't have cell service, which on the trail, there's a lot of cell service, so I didn't actually use that at all. And then I have my little medical kit, which is pretty much just a few band-aids, some, some gauze tape, moleskin, and some meds, ibuprofen, Tylenol PM, anti-diarrheal, yeah, just random odds and ends, but not very robust because I've found that I don't tend to need it. And then I have this sunscreen stick that was kind of a auxiliary to tube of sunscreen and we ended up burning through a lot of sunscreen. We bought another two while we were there and used a lot of that. So had those and then a bunch of earplugs and that is obvious to people who have camped or slept in any community spaces, but you need earplugs for other people who are loud and yeah, just make a lot of noise at night as well as for storms or wind if you're in a tent, especially if you're not super comfortable sleeping in that environment. It's very, very helpful to get you to sleep and get you a full night's sleep. Then this is just my toothbrush and Carmex, that's it. Then I brought a notebook, chamois butter. If you're a cyclist, you've probably heard of this. It is a anti-chafing cream basically. So if you do start to chafe anywhere, this stuff is a lifesaver, which I brought three and I ended up using one of them. So that is a lifesaver if you have any chafing problems anywhere. Headlamp, rechargeable, didn't use that much. Uh, gear tape, this is just to fix any tears in your tent material, jackets, things like that. Did use that. Matches, didn't use those. Uh, a bunch of paracord, didn't use that. More earplugs, Sharpie, super glue, used that because I crushed my last sunglasses and had to try to super glue the frames while we were on the trail, as well as use some Gorilla Tape to help put them together, which worked for the duration of the trip. And then this is kind of my survival kit. So there's like fire starter, duct tape, flint, whistle, emergency blanket, things like that in here. And I will try to, I'll link up the video to this kit and what I carry in it, because I went a little more in depth, but uh, everybody should have a kit like this that you bring with you. Then brought some uh, wet wipes just for toilet paper if there was not any at the places. And then I brought a water filter. This is a Sawyer Squeeze water filter and it will screw onto the top of a smart water bottle um, or anything with the same threads or the platypus bladder bottles. So I brought a couple bladders and then um, this thing and I didn't end up using it once because it turns out there is water all over the place along the whole way 
um, a lot of which are like fountains that you can just fill your bottle with and drink straight and so it's really nice um, I, I am glad that I brought it because it's really light and if I did get into a situation I guess where we had to drink from a stream and I wasn't super confident on what was upstream of that because there is a lot of livestock this would have been a little bit more comforting to use. Brought a bug net, ended up leaving it at the hostel because there was like no bugs other than a few flies. Lock, again, this is for before and after the trail in the hostels, um, locking your locker with your gear and making sure nobody runs off with it. For charging stuff, brought this adapter. So this has a few different plugs. It'll pop in and out um, depending on where you're at. So that's the, the one that we use there. And then if you're in the US, you can use that or UK and so there's all these different options here and then off the other side there's all the same options for output as well as USB-C on the side and USB-A or whatever on the bottom then I just had a bunch of different charging cords that I use so my iPhone charging cord had this battery bank this is a 10,000 milliamp battery and we have these little um, multi dongles that plug into there and then there's the iPhone charger, mini micro USB and a USB-C so you can charge phones, cameras, watches, whatever um, with the one cord you don't have to carry all of them. Other than that I had a couple more wall adapters and then Sadie had a similar setup um, with another battery but we ended up giving that way that one away in the train station to a girl who had missed her train and had a dead phone. So that is it. Then as far as the food and the planning necessity, stuff like that, this was the only water bottle that I brought. Ended up buying like, it was a, like a Gatorade type drink in the store before we left. And so we each had little bottles and we used those to mix any drinks that we want to mix. And then this was for our water the whole time. And we found that this was plenty sufficient. We had, these are a liter. And so we would just refill them anytime we crossed water. And that was plenty for me. And then kind of a luxury item, but we knew that there was going to be a lot of desire for coffee along the way both at refuges and towns and making it in the morning so we actually brought these little cordova thermos cups which is nice to have so it keeps your coffee warm in the morning while you're hanging around so then for food if you've been researching you've probably seen that there are so many options for food along the way and this is one of the things i'll talk about in the tips after this but we weren't quite sure exactly how that was going to look and what the timing was going to be like and so we wanted to be at least a little bit self-sufficient if we got places when they're closed or they just weren't you know, as frequent as we might have hoped. And so when we left, we brought six backpacking meals between the two of us. And so we got these Peak Refuels, which these are amazing. If you haven't had them, you need to try them because they're so good. Good protein and calorie count in these. So we had six of them, two breakfasts, four dinners. And those were kind of meant to be our, you know, if we don't have other options, we'll eat these. And we ended up eating five of them, Left had this last one remaining when we got off the trail. So it worked out pretty good. Honestly, more wouldn't have been a bad idea. We probably could have saved a ton of money on the trail but I'll talk about that here in a minute. So dehydrated meals, those don't weigh a lot. And then um, titanium long spoons that you can reach inside of them. Brought a Ziploc just in case we got stuff soaked or want to prevent things from getting soaked in a storm. Another dry bag, this is where we put our dehydrated meals. And then um, I brought a jet boil. So this is a little stove for boiling water and it nests up nice and compact. The stove itself keeps inside. And then I also brought some coffee, some instant coffee and some real coffee. So for coffee, because I'm a little bit of a coffee geek, I actually pre-ground at home using my grinder, a um, bunch of coffee, and then portioned it out into plastic bags in which I then just scooped into these little paper filters. So these things are these little thin light filters that I bought online, they're pretty cheap, and they just expand apart, hook on the side of your coffee cup, put the coffee in, and then it's just like a pour over that you can make. So it was great having the, the thermos and these together on the trail was such a treat in the morning and um, it was able to supplement all of the stops that we did in between for espresso <laughs> drinks. And then because you cannot fly with fuel canisters, we had to buy it once we got there um, along with a couple of other things. So that was the stove setup. Now, as far as the actual planning, so like I said, we didn't plan beforehand a whole lot at all. I had taken people's recommendation, ordered up this book, which is a guidebook for the TMB in which there's a lot of information. I didn't even open it until we left on the trip. And then I read on the flight a bit and it has different itineraries for different speeds. You know, if you want to shoot for a 
seven day version or a 14 day version. It has like, you know, the recommended route and stop and end point for each day. But it's primarily based around refuge staying. So if you're staying in refuges, awesome. That's cool. It looked like a lot of fun, but we weren't. We didn't have any of that stuff planned. And so we had to kind of do a little bit of self-research in this to plan things along the way. But it was really nice. It has all sorts of information from just all the amenities, the distances, the elevation gain, what you can find along the whole way. And so I found myself diving into this pretty much every single day, trying to plan out the next day and see what we would need to do. So I used that a lot. And then I had this big paper map. This was nice, um, not necessary, but it's just convenient to have it for emergencies. And also just to kind of get a general overview of the route that you're on and, and see the big picture to uh, plan things out. So. I think I'm going to try to put together actually a write up on our exact plan or our, our itinerary, what we did camping, because there's been a lot of questions on that and um, yeah, it might be useful. We ended up doing it in seven days and so seven days, six nights, which was pretty fast, but uh, yeah, we hadn't been able to, we didn't plan it out beforehand. So maybe I'll share how we went about doing that. So now to the last little bit of the items themselves, I brought a book. I did not read much because we ended up just hiking a ton and there just really wasn't much time. We were hiking almost from sun up to sun down each day. But then outside of that, a couple of general like travel things. I really like this fanny pack, it's REI as well. It's really low profile, so I can wear it under my shirt. And if you're in a zone where you think, you know, there's theft potential, then it's hidden. And so I keep my passport in here, as well as my ID, a credit card, some cash, and then like my AirPods or something. Something that I highly recommend, and this was taught to me by my brother who, has had some stuff stolen overseas, was to carry a second batch of identification and ways to buy things. So Sadie and I both in our backpacks would keep a copy of our passport, our IDs, travel insurance, and then we would keep additional cash and a debit card in there. That way, if either one of us got our stuff ripped off, we had duplicates you know, around and we could go figure out how to get our way out. And then with that, something that I started doing just before we left, and I'm very glad I did because it adds a lot of peace of mind, is using uh, air tab, air tabs? What is this thing called? Yeah, air tags. So these are, this is the Apple version, and they're these little tags that you just put them with your stuff and then you um, connect them to your phone and they will, basically geolocate where they are so long as I think they have to be within range of, you know, somebody's phone somewhere. I don't even know how it works, but pretty much what we did with these, we had one in our backpack and then one in my laptop case. And then at home here, I keep them in my camera cases, things like that. And at any point I can use my phone to locate it, which is really nice. So that's a good security measure. So that is all of the gear that I brought. Now, as far as tips and tricks, here are a few things that I um, think would be very helpful for anybody going. But before that, uh, changes that I would make. So I said the sleeping bag was a bit warm. It got really stormy the first two nights, lightning, thunder, rain, just ripping all night long, but the temperatures never dipped. So we did this between July 7th and 14th or 9th and I don't even remember now, but middle of July and the temperatures were really warm. So what I wish I would have done is looked at the forecast like the day before we left, looked at the lows, and then based my selection off of that. So gone just under the low temperature to where I would have been, you know, maybe slightly uncomfortable if weather got really bad, like an unforeseen storm. But I ended up having to like avoid my sleeping bag the whole time because it was so warm out all, you know, the whole time. And I, I don't usually get hot easily at night. And so if I were to do it again, same time, I would bring probably a 30 or 40 degree rated sleeping bag. So that's the first change. The second was, like I said, socks. I wore the one pair pretty much the whole time. So I'd probably ditch one of the three and just go with two. And then um, batteries in my phone and in my camera stuff, there was a lot more outlets along the way than I was anticipating. And so um, we were able to recharge so I could dump a few of those. All right, so last little bit of gear um, were the things that we couldn't bring. So we did not decide to bring trekking poles with us. Like I said, we were carrying everything on the airplane. And so we didn't bring trekking poles. We bought them once we got there. Um, and they were actually fairly cheap. And then we also had to buy the fuel canisters and then some extra snacks and a knife. So 
Now for a few tips on what I might recommend if you're going over there to do the Tour de Mont Blanc. First off, um, like I said, duplicate all of your identification and then also I would recommend having a digital copy. So put them in like a Google Drive folder, that way you can access it on your phone and just have it available. And then, like I said, have a copy with your, um, your partner, whoever you're traveling with, so that if anything gets lost, you won't have any problems getting back home. Now, the next one is, like I mentioned in the beginning, I would recommend wearing the lightest shoes that you think will provide the support that you can deal with. So I wore trail runners. Sadie wore some high top trail runners. They have a little bit more ankle support um, just because she's not quite as comfortable walking with a pack on uneven terrain and being confident that you're not going to roll your ankles. So go with the lightest option that you think is reasonable because like they say an ounce on your feet is like a pound on your back and so it adds up and on such a long trail it can really wear you down so that can be a factor that's worth considering now that also kind of goes with the whole overall principle of just not overpacking i am pretty limited on what i brought but there obviously were some things i didn't need that i bring like all of my camera equipment and the coffee cup things like that but i also knew that this was going to be inside of my range of capabilities and Sadie and I have both spent a lot of time on our feet this year we've both been running a bit and we've both hiked quite a bit and so um, I wasn't super nervous about that then the next thing is um, for primarily for before and after the trip if you are not familiar with using hostels I definitely recommend it I didn't know about them for a long time but hostels are they come in all different forms but they're just a cheaper option for lodging that usually involves some sort of tighter community sleeping and so they'll have like bunk rooms that have like little cubicles that you sleep in rather than getting your own hotel room or um, just shared amenities of different forms and so this can be a really really good way to save money um, Sadie and I have used the hostels quite a bit now in a variety of places around the world and they're just generally cheaper so you can travel less expensive and do more trips we like the app hostel world that's what i pretty much use to book all of them it's a database they have an app you can just search you can see where they're at their ratings people's reviews um, book them right there pay if you know i think it's like a small portion then you pay the rest when you get there um, as well as they actually have like a community side of it too where you can contact other people who are staying at that same place and are part of the community um, which I haven't really used, but it is nice. So use hostels. If you're not familiar with them, definitely recommend it. It'll expand your timeline of travelability. Next up is the gear storage. So like I said, we had to bring our laptop with us, but we didn't want to carry it on the trail. So we just needed it before the trip and after the, or before the trail and after the trail. And so the hostel that we stayed at actually had a locker at the facility and it costed like two euros for us to store our stuff there and you just paid once so long as you weren't getting in and out of it and then as soon as you unlocked it um, got your stuff out you had to pay again to lock it and so we just set it and then seven days later came back got my laptop and just like that it was two euros which was really cheap and they had bigger lockers and so i'm sure there's other options similar to that around the town they might be more expensive but um, that is an option if you need things for before or after your trip that you don't want to carry while you're on the trail and then, like I said, um, we left an air tag in with my laptop. And so if it did wander off, then hopefully I could find it, which would have been sad, but it didn't happen. So the next thing is, as far as the trail itself goes, I'm sure you've done research and you know that there are towns and refuges all along the way, but I don't think I quite grasped how much there was along the way. Um, I'm kind of used to wilderness areas in the US where wildernesses just don't have anything. And so you have to carry everything. This is like the opposite of that. You are on a trail with people everywhere and then there's like you get up to this beautiful ridge and there's a refuge there that you can you know buy a beer at or get lunch or whatever which was just mind-blowing to me um, really cool in its own right and then there's also towns along the way that have sporting goods stores you know transit everything you can imagine from a small town and they're it's set in the alps and so they have a lot of gear too which means you could buy your gear you know along the way if things break or you forget things so there are a lot of amenities along the way. And again, this book does say it, but I just didn't know how to translate that. You know, what, is it, what does it actually mean? With that, I will say, one thing I found is that we, we had just been traveling in Thailand this last winter where people are incredibly accommodating and nice and they want to help all the time. Um, we found that to not be the case all the time on the trail. If you go to a refuge that you're not staying at and you ask like if they have an extra seat for dinner or if you can buy you know a drink from them or something sometimes they act like it's an inconvenience to their life um, which I, I don't quite understand because 
I think they're there trying to earn money. Um, but sometimes they do that, which was kind of weird to me. But uh, yeah, so anyways, don't always count on refuges to have the desire to accommodate you. And I, I know obviously they book out and, and you can't just show up and expect that. But even with little things, sometimes they'll, they'll you know, not want to. So there is that too. And then also because the TMB goes through, you know, the three different countries, there is a bit of a variance in a lot of different ways. But one thing that we noticed was Switzerland is crazy expensive. It was like double the price for food um, as it was in I Italy. So we crossed the border and then it was like that night, you know, it's twice as much for a pizza and, and all these things. So if you're trying to go cheap, I would definitely recommend stocking up in Italy prior to going to Switzerland or, you know, France or wherever, because it was expensive. And then also in Switzerland, you are not allowed to wild camp. And so you have to pay for a campsite and it was like 40 something euros for us or francs or whatever it was, which was crazy because we stayed in like this campground with like a thousand other people but yeah so switzerland that part of the trail was expensive and uh, a lot of people but it was really pretty so made it through then a couple other things for hiking definitely bring a lot of sunscreen we had seen that recommendation it held true it is very exposed there's not a lot of tree cover on the trail and so you're gonna be in the sun all day long if you're hiking so have enough sunscreen and like i said you can buy it along the way if you do need to and then speaking of buying things we also bought a knife when we got to france so um, because we were flying with our gear we couldn't carry a knife onto the airplane and so we bought a knife and that was really useful just for cutting like cheese and meat or fixing gear if something does break having the ability to cut is really nice and then I just gave it away to some guy before we left so there's that and then the trekking pools like I said we bought those we got a cheap set uh, I think they were about 30 euros a piece um, and then we gave them away to some people before we left um, using the Facebook group that we had been watching which if you haven't gone to this Facebook group TMB something it is incredibly useful there are so many people on there that are helpful answering questions and you can go in there and search you know your questions before you ask that way you can dig up you know all the different people who have asked it in the past and see what people have to say so that that group is very useful and a lot of people will exchange gear do stuff like that um, that's really helpful so I would definitely recommend joining that if you're on Facebook next up uh, storms are really common so like I said the first two days actually the first three days we had lightning um, the first night was an incredible amount of lightning we were kind of exposed and so it actually was a little bit nerve-wracking we were in this um, high valley and it was just striking the hillside all around us and over us. So I didn't sleep like at all that first night and it was just pouring rain and windy. But then in the morning it cleared up and it was beautiful. So these storms, they come and they seem to go just as fast as they come. Generally when we were there, they were at night. Um, but then also after we left, left, we saw that there was some snow up at higher elevations um, one of the nights. So storms can roll in, but like I said, I think as long as your gear is decent and you're willing to know that you might have to hunker down if things go really south, then I wouldn't get too crazy with overpacking for it. I would pack for the probable, not the possible is kind of my um, philosophy. And as I've heard before from other people that we tend to pack our fears. So if you hear that and you get super scared and you start packing everything, then your pack will quickly reach, you know, 40, 50 pounds, which is not gonna be that fun on the trail. So all that to say, my gear was about just over 30 pounds because of all my camera gear. Sadie's was probably just over 20 pounds and it worked out just fine. We did it in seven days, clocked 118 miles um, with one of the variants and a bunch of little jogging and wrong turns. And um, I used Gaia and all trails to map our way through. And I think I will try to put this together and share it on my website, roadtoridge.com. So if you're looking and you're curious about the um, campsites, the gear, things like that, um, I'm gonna try to put it together. But for now, hope that was really helpful. And if you are considering the trip and nervous about it, don't be, give it a go. There's so many people to help and it is a beautiful, beautiful trip. And you can't beat having snacks along the whole way. We will catch you in the next one. Keep an eye out for the full video that's gonna be coming soon.